Hi, welcome back to Cold Pop. I'm your host, Jim Hall, and we've got a great new episode for you today. We've got Bob Fingerman on. Bob's a great author and artist. He's, uh, he's got a few things going on right now. We're going to be happy to talk with him about uh, his, his new book, Pariah. He's also got a graphic novel out, From the Ashes, which is uh, really amazing. And he's got a lot of other previous work that you're probably going to want to track down and get a hold of. He's just uh, really somebody special, and we're really proud to have him on. Later on in the show, we're going to have Mike Woolley, and uh, you know Mike's name from being the musical contributor to Cult Pop. He does a lot of our music backgrounds and such. Well, Mike's in a band, and uh, we're going to take a look at his newest uh, music video, really something special, and uh, I think you'll kind of dig it. So uh, you'll stay tuned for that later in the show. But right now, we're going to talk with uh, Bob Fingerman, and as I said, I'm really proud to have Bob on the show. Bob, thank you so much for being on Cult Pop today. Well, thank you for having me. Uh, Bob, you got a lot going on right now. Simultaneously, you've uh, just had Pariah hit the bookshelves. That's out now. Great zombie tale. And uh, you've also got From the Ashes, kind of a, a post-apocalyptic tale, but with a, uh, a fun little twist. Uh, you kind of star in it, a lot, a lot of groovy stuff going on there. And you've got a lot of other fantastic stuff that people can find via Amazon, via their local comic book or bookshops. You've got a lot of cool stuff, connective tissues. Uh, is a great graphic novel. Bottom Feeder is a great novel. So we've got so much to talk about, so let's jump right in. First thing I'd like to talk about, Bob, is Pariah. Okay. You've done an absolutely amazing job of writing. I absolutely love zombie fiction. I love zombie movies. I love zombie horror. But it was kind of starting to all mash together to me where everything seemed the same. Now you've come out with this book, Pariah, a group of survivors of a zombie apocalypse are holed up in a a Manhattan kind of high rise and it's just these survivors stories. And just what what a great story. Uh, I'm gonna stop right there and you can tell us as much about the book as you'd like from, from that point on. Yeah. Okay. No. The only I, I don't. I, the only thing I will clarify is yeah. It's not. It's uh, not a high rise. It's a walk up. And that's walk a. Up. It's okay. actually an important okay. distinction because it's a very small building. So uh, I kind of wanted to uh, play with the claustrophobia of it. In fact, some of the earlier drafts of the book I think were a little too claustrophobic. Um, but something where you know it was a very uh, confined amount of space and people really getting on top of each other. Uh, the few people that there are. Well, the thing I, I really, uh, really enjoyed about it, it's got all the, the book starts off, just heavy action, people trying to, some of the characters trying to, how they survived, how, how they get back to this apartment complex. Uh, I call it high rise, I, I guess it's lower flat, but they talk about, it gets into just some of the mundane uh, once the book's going, you're into the living process of people being trapped in this apartment complex. Uh, Trapping water on the roof. They 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 don't have plumbing. Uh, catching rainwater on the roof. Running out of vital supplies of food. Running out of just anything. Uh, there's no battery power. No obviously no air conditioning. And once the book gets going, uh, character Mona is introduced, and it's really amazing how she actually brings hope to this group, where they see her that they have all of their needs what is it, right across the street from them. There's like a save more, or a save a lot, or a, a grocery store right across the street. But in between there is what, millions of zombies running around. Then they see this young lady who can actually go through these zombies with no problem whatsoever. And, and they manage to contact her. And why don't you tell us a little bit about how she brings a lot of hope to the group, but also causes a lot of uh, divisiveness amongst the group when she arrives. Yeah. Um... Well, I mean, as, as with, you know, most books, especially if you're going to be playing with something as familiar as zombies, like, uh, like you were saying uh, in the introduction about how uh, certain things can become very familiar, you know, as a writer, the one thing you try to do is come up with, okay, what's my, you know, what's my new angle? What's the thing that hasn't been done? And I was thinking about what if somebody happened to be immune to zombies during a zombie outbreak? What if somebody actually repelled zombies just, you know, naturally? How valuable would that person be uh, in a world where everybody else is completely helpless? This one person who, you know, can go out and do things, can be completely unaccosted by, by the zombies would become extremely valuable. But the other thing is that person would also... Uh, just I think due to human nature, and human nature is what, I, what I'm what most interested in writing about, that person would also end up becoming someone other people would completely resent 
And um, so, yeah, I mean, basically, the, the way I wanted to structure the book was begin the book with these survivors where they're absolutely on death's door. They're starving to death. They're all out of their supplies. And then introduce this element of hope, uh, the girl Mona, and then take it for basically, you know, three-act structure to acts two and three would be, you know, if you were confronted with this girl who could go out and do what you can't do and she has freedom of movement and so forth, you'd want to know why. Uh, what's special about her? You might grow to resent her. And the thing about the character Mona was I made her uh, very opaque. She really doesn't have much of a personality, at least not one that's obvious. Um, you know, you've read the book. She gives very almost monosyllabic, very short answers to, to things. Yes, I was going to call her very aloof, that people would ask her questions, and why do you think you're repelling these zombies? Oh, I don't know, and it, it didn't even seem to interest her. Yeah, yeah, I mean, for her, the way she's wired, and I won't get into it too much because I want people to read the book, but yeah, I mean, for her it almost seems, you know, it's, it's, it's no big thing. She, that's just the way she is. She can go out there and she can deal with this. Um, you know, maybe she's shell-shocked by all the horrible things she's seen. Again, that's, that's for readers to, uh, to read about. But, um, so, I think, in a lot of ways, when people go from a bad situation to a much improved situation, um, it would bring back all of, I won't say people's worst characteristics, but in a way, when you're not just dwelling on the necessities, on just, <laughs> I just want food, I just want clean water, it gives you more free time to, yeah, and, well, in a way, to, to, there's recidivism, you know, if, if you're not that great a person, I think you're going to have time to become worse again. There's a character in the book, uh, Eddie, now he's lousy pretty much throughout the book. But he certainly gets worse when Mona shows up and, you know, he's got a full belly. Bob, the, the one thing I wanted to mention about the book is, is you're known as a satirist. A, a lot of your previous work is a great satire, humor, and, and a lot of solid stuff going on with, you know, From the Ashes we'll talk about later and other things where it's, it's definitely action and, and things. But with, with Pariah, you, there's definitely a lot of burning satire, a lot of dark humor. But you, you really ramped up the action and you really knocked it out of the park with this great horror zombie apocalypse book that stands on, on its own with all the other stuff out there and really rises above quite a bit. And that's why I was telling you I was so pleased to have you on because I enjoyed it so much. Uh, do you think that you are going to surprise a lot of your fans that are familiar with, with some of the sat just uh, your satire work in the past? I hope so. Um... The one thing, it, it's kind of funny, because I think the, 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 the satirical or the, the humor is innate in what I do, because in a lot of ways, I, <laughs> I thought Pariah was a lot straighter uh, than it is, uh, but many people at this point have remarked to me that they've, they've found it to be quite funny, and I think that's probably not because Pariah is a particularly funny book, but because most books of its genre don't have any humor. So I think right. any humor seems seems more. Uh, I won't say uh, exaggerated, but let's face it: most horror books don't tend to have a lot of levity, and for me, levity is very important, and it also uh, kind of sets off the horror more. I think. I think if you can kind of balance a little bit of humor, it it kind of makes the the. Uh, the darkness that much darker. I well, I absolutely agree, and I, I think with Pariah, uh, I told I wrote to you uh, before the show how much I really thought you knocked this one out of the park. I, I really think you're going to have a big hit on your hands because I, I think the the zombie element. People love zombies. It's hot right now. It's been something that's uh, sparked people's imaginations for 30, 40 years. The, the whole thought process. But the way you've got these folks trapped and then the stories that then evoke from there are, are fantastic. Um, I want to ask you one more question about Pariah and, and then we'll move on to some other stuff. Do you see, not, if not returning to that particular world and those particular characters, 
uh, would you like to continue on in that type of uh, darker horror down the line? Oh, well, I definitely, I mean, my goal is I really do want to write a horror book that gives me nightmares. <laughs> I mm -hmm. mean, that would be the ultimate goal for me. Um, certainly, I, I've got a fairly rich dream life, and, and I often wake up thinking, what the hell is wrong with my brain, and why does it enjoy tormenting me so much? So I'd kind of like to do a book that torments my readers as much as me. That's a fairly lofty goal. Um, but actually, I'm hoping, we'll see, uh, I'm hoping Pariah would be the first book of a trilogy. Okay. Um, because my, my goal, it wasn't my initial goal, I mean, Pariah was written as a one-off, but, you know, you, you get into the characters, and I think a lot of authors who end up writing a series of books probably don't intend necessarily to write a series, but you grow to, uh, you know, you become enamored of your characters in a way, and the character Mona is a character I'd like to explore in more depth. Um, so I'm hoping that Pariah will be a launch book for, for two more. I mean, I couldn't see it going any longer than that. Uh, at this point, I now have something kind of um, mapped out uh, that I'd like to take her on a, on a journey, and uh, hopefully the readers will, will want to go on it with her. Oh, fantastic. Well, I'm glad to hear that. And I'd be remiss if I didn't mention, you're a fabulous graphic artist, and you kind of used a unique way to uh, sprinkle art throughout the book as one of the characters is an artist. And so some of the renderings, uh, at least I took them, that it's this particular character's renderings of the different zombies and stuff appear throughout the book. And I think that adds a lot to it. I thought that was a very cool addition to the novel. Yeah, well, that's why I didn't draw them in my, in my traditional style. It's also why I signed them in his name. Right. Because, um, yeah, I, I, there's a character named Alan who... Uh, I think I call him the Audubon of the Undead. He just sits in his window and does these studies of the uh, of the undead. And so um, my editor and I thought it would be fun to put some of his drawings in the book. They're not illustrations. They're just little studies of, of some of the zombies. Yeah, they're, it's a really neat addition. I thought that was kind of a... A, a neat little add-on to the book. I, I wasn't expecting that, and I thought that was kind of neat. Uh, next, I, I wanted to talk about uh, something else that's on the shelves right now. Uh, IDW has From the Ashes out collecting your uh, your comic book, and that's a, a really neat uh, post-apocalyptic adventure you put out there, but it's got a little special twist, so why don't you tell the folks at home uh, a little bit about From the Ashes. Yeah, well, <laughs> the special twist on that was uh, I did it as a memoir. I, I came up with this term at least I think I came up with the term speculative memoir, uh, just popped into my head. And I had already been writing a post-apocalypse book, um, just a straight post-apocalypse adventure as a novel, and I sort of hit a wall on it, but I still was in this post-apocalypse frame of mind, which, <laughs> frankly, I am in more often maybe than is healthy. Uh, but... So I didn't want to get away from the post-apocalypse, but I wanted to do something, in a way, something lighter with it. And right at that time, and just ongoing, memoirs were getting written up everywhere, you know, be they just straight prose, or be they all these, they call them graphic novels, but they're not graphic novels, they're graphic memoirs. And so I thought, all right, let me do something that's uh, as narcissistic <laughs> as a memoir, but hopefully as entertaining as uh, The Road Warrior or something. So it was, it was really a, a kind of Reese's Peanut Butter Cups moment of let's take two things and, you know, hopefully they'll taste great together. So I did this speculative memoir set in post-apocalyptic uh, New York starring uh, my wife and I and mutants and the undead and, you know, everything. Also, everything that I think was lacking in contemporary post-apocalypse entertainment. Post-apocalypse entertainment... Uh, that's hard to say, has gotten very serious, yeah. <laughs> which seems like maybe that's the way it should be. But, uh, you know, it's you, you just don't see mutants anymore. Mutants used to be de rigueur for, uh, for uh, the post-apocalypse, and now everybody's just, you know, crawling around on their bellies starving. So, you know, I wanted to take it out of Cormac McCarthy territory and put it back in, in sort of 50s men in rubber suits territory a little bit. Yeah, and it's really neat, uh, folks at home that are watching the show, you can find it in two formats. You can find it in a beautiful graphic novel collected format, or if you like, as the individual comics, and both are readily available either via the internet or at your local comic shops or, or booksellers, uh, specifically for the graphic novel. And uh, 
I found out about books. it after uh, it got into the graphic novel form, but it would have been a real hoot to have read that as each individual issue came out. I, I think that was a, a, a really great story, and, and it must have been a lot of fun for the monthly readers. Um, you've got a lot of other uh, were connective tissues. Uh, Bottom Feeder was your first novel. I, I, I want you to mention that up too. But you've got so much stuff out there, Bob, that's still readily available either through Fanographics or some of the companies you've worked for. Is there some other works you'd like to tell the folks at home about that, that, you really, that you're proud of and you'd really like people? You, you've got a lot of acclaimed stuff out there and all of it's still available. What is some of the stuff you'd like to tell the folks at home about? Well, you mentioned before a book called Connective Tissue. And that, I think, is sort of my neglected gem. Uh, I think that was a book that was just too weird for, for people to know what to do with, including retailers, because um, it's an illustrated novella, so it's kind of neither, neither comic nor novel. Uh, it's a profusely illustrated uh, book. I mean, it's a good, solid read. Um, and it's definitely the weirdest book I ever did. I mean, it's very trippy. You know, it's, it's sort of, I don't know... Um, kind of a, a, a chemical Alice in Wonderland um, about a video store clerk who through uh, basically choking <laughs> on some artificial meat flavored candy so already you know it's a little different she ends up going off into another dimension uh, and anyway that's a book that I, I loved doing it it was uh, it was a real experiment because actually that was a book that was the first book it's the only book I've ever done where I did the majority of the art before I'd written a word. I just, I kind of wanted to reverse engineer an illustrated book. Usually, you know, you write your text and then you do the art to accompany it. And in this case, I just started doing these very stream of consciousness uh, images and sort of a story began to emerge just through, through doing the drawings, but I, I wrote the text later and then did a couple of of the drawings to just kind of fill in some of the some of the stuff that emerged when I was doing the writing but that that book was was a real joy to do and like I say it kind of fell between the cracks so I hope people maybe take a look for it yeah and the great thing about the internet now and and the the different sellers online is that all of this stuff is readily available all of your old work uh, is still in print and and can be picked up so that that's why I wanted you to have an opportunity to kind of pimp some of that stuff because you've got some really great stuff out there. And I'd be remiss, Bob, if we didn't talk a little bit about your time with, uh, we, we've got a couple minutes left with uh, uh, Cracked. And, and why don't you tell us a little bit about that because I know you've got a lot of fans from that work. <laughs> now you're getting Mike Wallace on me, <laughs> going into the dark, dirty secrets of my past. That's a long time ago. Yeah, Cracked, uh, Jesus, Cracked was, was 25 years ago. Um, I don't know, you ask me what you want to know because <laughs> Sure. Well, How I much? guess, God, I, I have some of my, uh, even speaking with Jerry before, the Cracked magazines and, and uh, uh, Mad and all that type of stuff are, are some of my favorite memories as a young adult and a, a, a teenager and things like that. And just, was it just a hoot? You, you were a young man working on it back then. Was it a hoot working on Cracked? Was it just something uh, really special or was it just a, another job for you? I wish it was a hoot. Uh, it, be it becomes. <laughs> well, it sounds like we really got into something good here. Yeah, and it becomes more hoot-like with 25 years of uh, distance between it and and now. now. It was exciting because it was my first regular gig. So you know, mm -hmm. I was I was really young when I started with them. I think I was 20. So you know, I was excited to be doing the work, but uh, the bloom <laughs> the bloom fell from the rose pretty quickly. Um, in fact, uh, sort of as a as kind of therapy for myself when I was doing work for Cracked, because of course Cracked was pitched solely at kids. Sure. Uh, it just in my own time, my, my own work became way more pornographic, way more just ugly and violent. It was like everything I couldn't draw for Cracked, I began just drawing for my for myself as sort of, sure. like I say, kind of a therapy type thing. I don't know. Cracked was pretty rough, actually. Um, <laughs> they were they were a fairly sleazy enterprise to, to be working for at the time I was working for them. So, Well, certainly didn't want to bring up any bad memories, but I, I know a lot of people when, when I mentioned that, you know, I was kind of excited that we were having you on and they said, oh yeah, you know, Cracked Magazine, it is something you are known for as a, you know, it, it, it is what, what it is, but I, I just was curious what you thought about it. But uh, we're just about out of time, uh, Bob. I wanted uh, folks at home to be able to find you, 
uh, online? Do you have a presence online you'd like people to know about, either via Facebook or a website or, um, or anything like that? Well, the best place would just be to, to go to uh, bobfingerman.com. That's the simplest. And then from there, you know, Google me. <laughs> There's okay. a lot of Google we, Yeah, hits. we've had your website ID up throughout the show, and people see that. And uh, basically, Bob, I just want to tell you it's been an absolute pleasure having you on. And as uh, your pariah stories continue or any other type of stuff you put out, we'd absolutely love to have you on the show again. So thank you so much for being on the show today. Well, thank you for so much for, uh, for having me. It was, it was great. Excellent, excellent. Uh, folks at home, stay tuned. When we get back, we will have more Cult Pop. Welcome back to Cult Pop. I'm Jim Hall. And again, I just want to thank Bob for being on the show. Bob Fingerman, a uh, great guest. Folks, I can't recommend enough. Track down some of his stuff. Pariah was a fabulous book. His graphic albums are amazing. From the Ashes is a great graphic novel to pick up, or the comics, and some of his other stuff. Just kind of Google him or go, go to his website and see his stuff. All of it's readily available. Some really fun reading out there, so I really recommend you track him down. But now we're going to move on and talk about Mike Woolley, a name you're familiar with if you've uh, visited the website or watched the show before. Mike's been on the show a couple times to talk about various things. But uh, Mike's a great musician. Uh, he's in a band called Dream Gaze. And uh, Mike uh, works with cult pop in the sense that he does the shows open. He does a lot of the bump music. So he's, he's vital in, in helping cult pop do some real creative stuff. A lot of the images and even the uh, cult pop logo was created by Mike. So a uh, great artist, great uh, musician, a uh, really good friend of mine. But uh, uh, Mike's in a band, Dream Gaze, and they've uh, got a really great album out. And... Uh, we're going to have his, uh, the email up for that. Really want you to think about getting that CD because it's really cool stuff. But more importantly, there's a uh, video supporting one of the songs from their newest album. And it's really amazing. And I thought you guys would really be interested and want to take a look. So let's take a look at the video right now.
Well, what did I tell you? A pretty cool video, huh? That's Dream Gaze. That's uh, Mike Woolley, a contributor here at Cult Pop. Like I said, Mike does the music and a lot of the graphics and different stuff. So I, I really wanted to bring that uh, to your attention. Uh, you saw the website uh, throughout the video. We popped that up for you. Uh, track it down. Pick up the CD. Some really cool atmos atmospheric type stuff. Uh, he's a big uh, fan of the old, uh, they're, they're fans of the old uh, 80s and 90s alternative scene and, and there's a lot of that influence there so absolutely fantastic uh, CD I recommend you pick it up and uh, Mike can be reached uh, via the website you saw and uh, if there's something else you can always uh, drop me a line and I'll forward it on to him but uh, Mike is the guy I get a lot of comments about uh, the graphic or the design the cult pop logo was designed by Mike so some real cool stuff uh, both artistically and musically from Mike so uh, we're glad to be able to bring that to you. And I will have Mike on the show uh, down the line. He's got some other things going on. So we'll interview Mike once again. But if you go to the website, you can check uh, Mike out. He'd been on the show a couple of times in the past, so you can kind of see what Mike's got going on. But, uh, folks, I appreciate you so much watching Cult Pop. As always, if you're just watching this at home, you can check out our website, www.cult-pop.com, and you can check out every episode we've ever done. Uh, we love it when you visit us and send us an email. So we will wrap up the show and we'll see you next time.